It's the year of the garden, and where better to celebrate than Victoria, B.C., the city of gardens. Recorded on the traditional territories of the Lekwungen and Wasanich nations, this series examines local history, culture, and ecology over a nice cup of tea. So put the kettle on and join us. Welcome to Tea and Gardens. Today, we have the absolute pleasure of having tea in the gardens here at Point Ellis House. Point Ellis House is one of the oldest houses in Victoria in one of the noisiest parts of town. So, you may be hearing some noise in the background. We assure you, once you get into the gardens, next to the water, it's an absolute oasis. So, let's go check it out. Point Ellis House was the home of the O'Reilly family for many years. We'll hear more about them later when we tour the house, but first we were shown the garden. If Victoria is known as the city of gardens, I would say Point Ellis House is one of the less known gardens. And because we're located in an, what is today an industrial neighborhood, a lot of people have no idea that there's two acres of heritage gardens uh, here in, in this neighborhood. I will say on that as well, when visitors arrive, they usually comment to me that they thought they were lost before they finally found our gate. So that uh, attests to us being a hidden gem, not only in Victoria, but in the neighborhood here, just tucked against the water there. We have the longest remaining natural shoreline on the Gorge Waterway. So the gardens here are particularly special and tell us a lot about native and non-native species on Vancouver Island and in Victoria. And so we've spent the last almost three years restoring it, putting in raised garden beds, putting in irrigation systems, removing the invasive species, basically reclaiming the South Garden for the purposes of food and cut flowers, which is what the O'Reilly family of Point Ellis House used it for. So we've kind of reinstated that historical connection, which serves the purposes of history and storytelling, but also growing food for the community. So it's win-win. And what do you grow here today? Oh, all kinds of things. Right now we've got herbs, we've got strawberries, We've got salad greens that are about ready to be harvested. Uh, we've got our garlic, which is about ready to be harvested. Blueberries, we have pear tree, some apple trees, and cut flowers as well. And so when you harvest all those things, what, what do you do with it? Yeah, so we've built a relationship with Kool-Aid Society Sandy Merriman House, which is an emergency transition shelter for women. And so a lot of the food that we grow here goes to them to help support the residents there. There's the community fridge up the street uh, that has recently been created that we will probably put some of our extra food into right. the community fridge, which is essentially a fridge for that has food and a pantry that has food for anyone who needs it. So who tends to the gardens? Do you have volunteers? So we have two garden staff, one of whom is responsible for the South Garden. And then we also have a team of dedicated volunteers who help us plant seeds, harvest seeds, pull weeds, rake and mow and all of that kind of stuff. And we definitely could not do it without the volunteers. So not only is the food being grown going back into the community, but community members are helping grow that food as well. So it's a story here at Point Elsos that we're quite proud of. You also have a woodland walk. So if people yes. come here to see the gardens, what else uh, could they explore? The woodland walk is part of the garden experience here at Point Ellis House in that in the Victorian era, it was common to have your formal gardens, but also your sort of quote unquote wild area. And so the woodland walk here essentially takes you along part of the shoreline and you can see trees that were planted by Peter O'Reilly that are non-native, but you can also see enormous arbutus trees and Gary Oaks, and you'll see the trails where the river otters haul themselves up out of the water. So it's this little segment of the experience here for visitors that gives you a sense of 
the natural shoreline here at Point Ellis House and its importance to the ecosystem of the harbour and the city itself. I very much cherish the woodland walk for all the animals that I get to see. Uh, we have some bald eagles that like to hang out in our mature trees, blue herons along the, the shoreline there. Um, and then Kelly also mentioned the river otters that we get. We've got little raccoons that like to hang out. So it attracts a lot of wildlife um, that you don't, living in a city, you don't always get the chance to see. And especially being in a located in a neighborhood like this, you wouldn't, you wouldn't even think that you'd see those things when you come to visit. So I always get to see animals when I'm at work and that makes me happy. Next, we joined Christia, who explained the history of the house and the O'Reilly family. Hello. Wow. So, this is our biggest, gaudiest room. <laughs> Sorry, what did you say? This is our biggest, gaudiest room. <laughs> this is the drawing room of the O'Reilly family. So Point Ellis House was built in 1861, but its construction finished in 1862. And in that time, the Wentworth Wallace family moved in and they lived there for about five years, but they fell on hard times and moved out in 1867. And at that time, the O'Reilly family moved in and they lived here until 1975. So that's three generations of O'Reilly's and they never threw anything out. So everything in this room Everything in this entire house, right down to the bed sheets, is original to the O'Reilly family. I always like to point out the cabinet in the corner, just because it is a uh, curiosity cabinet, which is like the feature of many 19th century drawing rooms and many of the biggest museums in the world, including the British Museum, started as a curiosity cabinet, which I think is really cool. So this is Peter O'Reilly's study. Peter O'Reilly was the patriarch of the O'Reilly family. He was many things over the course of his career. He was a judge, he was a gold commissioner, and most notably, he was the Indian Reserves Commissioner for 18 years. So his job was to go out to uh, the various nations of BC and stake out and Tell the First Nations people, this is how much land you have. This is the land that you are allowed to hunt and live on. Um, he was not always the best for consulting with the First Nations people when their chiefs were present. So there was quite a bit of controversy even then, especially among the First Nations people about the amount of land that they were receiving. But this room is very beautiful, but it has a little bit of a history to it because this is where he would have corresponded with letters and essentially worked when he was not traveling British Columbia. And one thing that I always like to point out to people is out this window where he would have sat and worked is what used to be the Songhees Reserve. So the Indian Reserve Commissioner kind of sat in this big beautiful house and overlooked a reserve that he laid essentially the parameters for. How do you feel working here and in, in being able to share this story and put it in a context that maybe museums haven't done before? I am really excited to be a part of this kind of um, new side of museums. A lot of museums and cultural heritage sites are acknowledging the colonial history in a way that they haven't before. And I'm really excited to be working here and being able to talk about this because Point Ellis House, you know, like I mentioned earlier, like we need to talk about the Indian Reserve Commission, but we can also talk about tea service and we can also talk about Kathleen O'Reilly. So we can talk about all of these things, but things like this should be talked about. So this is Kathleen O'Reilly's room. Kathleen was the eldest daughter of Peter and Caroline O'Reilly. And she lived here pretty much her entire life. She was very well traveled, so she did spend some time in England. She was quite the artist. Most of the paintings in this room are done by her. But she was also sought after by many gentlemen. So she actually never married, but she was pursued by the likes of Harry Stanhope, as well as Robert Scott of the ill-fated Antarctic exploration. So, yeah. Who is this portrait of? Is that her? Uh, it's believed to be her, yeah. 
Kathleen is of interest because she was the eldest daughter of the O'Reillys, and she's also relevant to one of the artifacts that I'm going to show you a little bit. Great. Um, this is the dining room. Uh, one thing that I like to bring up to people who come and visit is the fact that we have a collection of well over 500 calling cards, and it's essentially the 19th century equivalent of a Facebook friends list. So we know who came and dined at this table because, well, they came and called and they left a card and we still have the cards. So we know for a fact that Sir Johnny MacDonald probably dined at this table. We know about Sir Matthew Bailey Begbie and Arthur Creese and the Church family. Anybody in local politics you can name from the 19th century probably dined in this room at some point. On the other side of that, though, they were waited on by domestic staff who were primarily Chinese immigrants. Uh, and as we go in further into the house, we'll look at some of the areas where they lived. But for the most part, uh, yeah, it was domestic Chinese staff who would either walk over from Chinatown or they would spend the night in the servant's room here. So this is more of the working side of the house. This is where you'll find the boys' rooms as well as the scullery and the kitchen and all of the things to do with domestic staff. I think of major interest to you folks is our china pantry. So this is our collection of various plates and teacups and tea kettles and side plates. Uh, but I've taken a few items out of here today to show you in more detail as well. It looks like you're being watched right now. We're all being watched. Yeah. <laughs> so, Can you talk about who we're looking at here? Yeah. So these are the three O'Reilly children. We have Kathleen O'Reilly. Uh, the one in the middle is Frank, who is the eldest, and this actually would have led to his room originally, but it is currently our archival storage. And the youngest is Jack, who uh, his bedroom is just behind you. So this is the servery. This is where food would have been plated and served before it was carried off to the dining room. All of these cupboards would have had linens and you know extra cutlery and anything else needed for the dining experience in the 19th century. And finally, we're in the kitchen, which is the second last room in the house. Uh, this is where the Chinese domestic staff spent most of their time in Point Ellis House, preparing food, washing dishes, and caring for the house and the people who lived here. Next, we went to the drawing room to take a look at the special items that had been selected for us. So I have a couple artifacts to share, including this tea service. Um, this white pattern design has some Japanese motifs. Uh, a lot of the china in the O'Reilly collection in Point Ellis House is Japanese, interestingly enough. Um, and this set is no exception. This white set was actually gifted to Peter, allegedly, according to our catalog by Robert F. Scott, who was part of the Antarctica expedition in 1910 uh, that did not end well. And this was a gift to Peter O'Reilly because at one point he was uh, pursuing per Peter's daughter, Kathleen O'Reilly. So this very well may have just been a friendly gift or it may have been a I am pursuing your daughter, here is a gift, <laughs> with a little bit more of an intention behind it. Um, there's also a couple pieces missing, which just kind of goes to show the history behind the tea services, which I think is really interesting. So this little red teapot is not matching, but unfortunately there was no matching teapot for this white service. That was part of the gift. Um, I just really liked the design on it and I wanted to show it off. So you can see some of the wear on some of these items that just show that they were items that were used. They weren't just for display. I was going to do an unboxing video for you. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so this is a little tea service to go. So it's a little wicker basket, which I've set out here. And the top opens like this, mm. and you can see uh, the patent as well as the directions for how to use it, which is really fun. And you've got 
um, almost a complete tea service here. So you've got a little burner where you would um, light your little flame so you could heat up your water. You've got a couple little containers to put your tea, any snacks. You've got three plates and you've also got a container for mustard because of course, <laughs> as well as a few other little uh, jars and containers in here that I think had several different uses. I also have this to show off as well. It's something in our collection that we've turned into a poster for sale. It's from a children's book. We're all very fond of it. <laughs> I could look at this forever. Inspired by the cats, we headed to the lawn for a tea party with the Point Ellis House team. <laughs> Should I take one? Absolutely. There's milk and sugar. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm going to keep it black. Some milk. Could you tell us about the tea that we're drinking, please? Well, this tea is Point Ellis House tea, and it's made by Silk Road Tea Company. Um, and it's a special blend made just for us here at Point Ellis House. And it's a black tea? It is a black tea. The past, uh, some of the past curators here at Point Ellis House about a decade or more ago were going through the collection and they found an old tea tin that had some remnants left in it. And so they took those to Silk Road, which analyzed them and um, their research found that it was a black tea blend. And so they recreated it. And um, now we have the privilege of selling it here in our gift shop at Point Ellis House. And it offers a little bit of a historical connection between uh, tea service then and, and now. It certainly seems like the O'Reilly's drank a lot of tea in this house. I think so. Certainly the amount of teacups we have would be evidence of that. Mm -hmm. Tea on the lawn uh, was a very popular event here historically among the O'Reilly's and their friends and their, the, the social elites of, of Victoria and British Columbia. Have you ever tried to drink out of the teacups in the collection? <laughs> we would never. It would no. never. No. no. Not allowed. <laughs> Not allowed. That's why we have these reproductions. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, having such a large and rich collection is truly a gift that keeps on giving, um, as I'm sure Christia will attest to mm -hmm. as the expert of all the objects. It's always really fun to dig into what we've got here and come up with something new to say based on a different set or subject that we're trying to dig into. Yeah. I wondered if you could tell us a bit about, we were in the kitchen earlier, we saw the recipe cards. Yes. Could you tell us a bit about those? So before I was an employee here, I was a student at uh, the University of Victoria. And we, for our public history course, partnered with Point Ellis House, and we were doing some projects based on the house. and. In the team that I was on, we decided to try to do and delve into more of a sensory experience of the house, which you can't eat or drink in the house, but as a way to bring the sense of taste to visitors, uh, we dug into some of the historical recipes that are in the collection. And so we selected nine of them, uh, adapted them for modern kitchens, which it doesn't always translate very nicely. If you have a wood-fired stove or a coal-fired stove, it's a lot different than our electric stoves. We sussed out all those details, adapted them for modern kitchens, and then we uh, made recipe cards out of them. And so visitors can grab a recipe card from the gift shop on their way out and try their hand at some of the historical recipes that are in the collection here. Very cool. Why is there such a strong tea culture in this city? It's connected to the sense of Victoria being a place that represents the British Empire and the sort of height of British settler colonialism and this little bit of old England, if you will, uh, on the west coast of North America. And part of that is also connected to tourism. And especially in the sort of post Second World War era, 
Vancouver Island, Victoria in particular, becomes a real destination for tourists, but especially American tourists. And those visitors really wish to see something of little old England uh, that they may have heard about and get, get that experience of castles and tea and what have you uh, here on the island without having to maybe travel all the way to London. And even when Point Ellis House was opened as a private museum by the last descendants of the O'Reilly family, they were very much looking to attract tourists to this place, especially American visitors. So they were in constant communication with the bus lines to bring visitors off the ferries from downtown to Point Ellis House. They dressed in period costume to offer that quote unquote authentic experience. So I think the sort of um, obsession or passion for tea in Victoria, it, it comes from those sort of British Empire roots and this long going, what is now a tradition uh, in some ways, uh, an effort to attract American visitors in particular. Um, and But I think the fact that what the British made of tea was connecting it to a particular set of rituals that were also tied into social status and class hierarchy. And that part of it was transported around the globe to places like Victoria. And that's why tea service at Point Ellis House from a historical point of view was so important to have that time with your social circle to put in the time, keeping up appearances, having those conversations about how things were going in the early days of a colony or a new province. So that aspect of it remained essential to the O'Reilly family uh, when they lived here and also when they tried to operate it as a tourist site as well. The thing that most interested me about this place when I first encountered it as a student at UVic was the different connections that we find from this place. So not only is this a family home and it was a family home for many, many years, but also because of the nature of Peter O'Reilly's job, it took him around the province of British Columbia a lot on his travels, uh, whether that was as a judge, as a gold commissioner, or as Indian reserve commissioner for the province. And that means that the history of this house is tied with the entire province. And I've been a lifelong British Columbian, and I have a special place in my heart for the history here, uh, having grown up in this province. And working here gives me an opportunity to delve a little bit more deeply into that history that it's not always pretty, but it's never boring. What does it mean to you to work here? Wow, it means a lot. It means I get a job in history, which is pretty awesome. Point Ellis House is like the best research project you ever had. As other staff have said, this place has so many stories to tell and we're always learning more every day. Um, it, it means an opportunity to actively connect with people about the history of this place. And that is really something that I'm passionate about. And I know everybody who works here and volunteers here is passionate about the idea that we get to welcome people to such a special place every day keeps us all going. And so for me, just connecting with people about the history of this place is probably the number one thing that Point Ellis House, you know, provides for me in terms of a, a passion to to make this place open and accessible and talk about the romance of drinking tea with Sir Robert Scott of Antarctic fame and to talk about the, you know, the dark side of BC Canadian history of Peter O'Reilly and Sir John A. Macdonald drinking tea and talking about what they called, quote unquote, the Indian land question. Those conversations happened here, those encounters happened here, and 
when we get to uncover them for people or make them visible for people, that's super rewarding and, and really keeps us going here. We love the team at Point Ellis House. They have so many interesting projects going on. We could have talked to them for hours and drank a lot of tea. If you'd like to hear more, you can check out our podcast, which has extended versions of the interviews. And we'll see you next time.